So thank you everyone very much for joining us for this evening's uh, Knowledge in Motion program on behalf of the Spalding New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury Center. My name is Dr. Sherry Blauett. Um, I work with Dr. Excuse me, with Ms. Bethlin Houlihan as the uh, co-directors of Knowledge Translation and Dissemination for the Model Systems, and we're very proud to be here with you tonight. Um, we also want to welcome our webcast attendees. There are many of us here in the room, but we actually have folks from 26 states across the U.S. and countries including Canada and India and Sweden tuning in over the webcast this evening, so pretty exciting. Um, we'd also like to thank um, all of our guests, and if he's here, I don't think he's here, but we also always want to give a shout out to our director um, of the model systems, Dr. Ross Safant, our chair of PM&R here at Spalding. So this evening, we're going to be um, really taking a deep dive into the use of robotics and technology and how they can have impact on the lives of people with spinal cord injury. Our discussion is going to be led by Dr. Paula Bonato, who's the director of our motion analysis laboratory here at Spalding, um, and also an associate professor of PM&R and um, an adjunct professor of biomedical engineering at MGH um, Institute of Health Processions, as well as being involved at MIT and the Weiss Institute and many other institutions around town. Um, Dr. Bonato's research is focused on the development of rehabilitation technologies, particularly with focus on wearable technology and robotics to improve and enhance quality of life for individuals with mobility um, impairment. Um, Dr. Bonato is going to be joined this evening by several consumers and also members um, of our team. Uh, so we'll hear from these folks over the course of the evening, but briefly introducing Tim Morris and Eric Larson, uh, two consumer robotics users, as well as Katie Schramm, uh, doctor of physical therapy, Ann O'Brien, also from physical therapy, um, and Catherine Adams-Dester, who is um, Dr. Bonato's research assistant. So uh, we have a big team here this evening, and I don't want to take any more time because it's going to be exciting. Thank you again for joining us, and uh, now we'll give Dr. Bonato the floor. Thank you. So thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for coming um, to this uh, uh, event uh, tonight. So I'll um, give you a presentation about some of the technologies that um, we study at Spalding. And I'll just make sure that uh, yeah, the clicker works. It does, excellent. Um, and I'll take um, a perspective that's uh, an engineering perspective. And the reason is because my background is actually uh, engineering. Before I start, um, I'm used to um, lecture at uh, uh, courses that provide CME credits, and so you have to provide a disclosure. And I have very little to disclose. I, uh, I serve on the advisory board on one of the companies that actually manufactures robotic technology, and I do that as an uncompensated position. I do it purely for the purpose of um, uh, facilitating and fostering the development of technologies that are useful for our patient population. So let's, let's start talking about um, the uh, motivation of um, the engineering world to develop technologies um, that are useful for individuals who are undergoing rehabilitation and interventions. And so as an engineer, the first thing that I want to do is to reassure you that we are working for you. And in fact, uh, engineering is quite a unique profession from that point of view. What you see on the right side of the screen is the uh, logo of the International Society of Electrical Engineering that I'm part of, and the um, motto of the logo is Advancing Technology for Humanity. Uh, contrary to some of the basic sciences where you, you just do it for the purpose of discovering um, the next particle or things of, of the nature, right? In engineering, we really care for uh, making sure that we actually deliver technology to end users that are useful for, for end users as well, and, and they change uh, their quality of life as well as change uh, technologies that change our quality of life. And so because I am an engineer, then I can also uh, discuss with you whether engineers are, are, are doing a good job. Right? And what I'm going to try to convince you throughout the talk is that um, we could do better, right? And so, and I think I'm going to have a good audience uh, from, from that point of view. 
and perhaps during the discussion, uh, you will give us ideas about things uh, that we should do uh, to better meet um, people's uh, needs. So I want to use the words of a good friend and colleague of mine at MIT, Hugh Herr. You might be familiar with him. He is very well known in the uh, rehabilitation engineering community. He is a double amputee himself. Unfortunately, he was in an accident. And so he lost uh, both legs uh, below uh, the knees. And since then, he has devoted his professional activities to build technologies for rehabilitation applications with uh, uh, emphasis on um, prosthetics, of, of course, uh, uh, that's, that's his area of interest. And I like um, very much his way to look at technologies and, and users of rehabilitation technologies. And uh, you hear likes to say that, in fact, there are no humans uh, who are disabled or person that are broken because there is no such thing as a broken person. And of course, this is a particular meaning given his, his uh, personal experience. But it's rather the environment that we build and the technologies that are broken. And so what we need, what we ought to do as an engineering community is to develop technology that actually re-enable uh, capabilities and provide the opportunities to transcend disability. I'm paraphrasing uh, the sentence, uh, statement that you see there, and it's something that I assure you provides great, a great deal of motivation to an individuals who work uh, uh, in this field from the engineering point of view. So let me provide after um, a serious light um, a bit of a funny example so that we get on the same page that technology is in fact broken. And then we start talking about um, technologies that are emerging that in fact could uh, uh, meet some of our requirements and wish. And so what I want to talk about is your commute, right? And I think that as much as we get a lot of advertisements about cars, cars are terrible. So I can't think of a worse time of my day than driving in and not being able to do anything else than having my hands on the steering wheel and for an hour I'm just wasting time, right? And so the only useful thing that I do is just to listen to the radio. So, you know, I just get myself, uh, I get the news, right? So I get myself up to date. But I mean, it's just a terrible technology if you think about it, right? And so because we end up in a traffic jam every single morning, right? And so, so what if we had technology that would allow us um, to make the trip being engaged in other things, right? And so I was lucky enough, um, about 10 years ago, I was actually at Google X uh, just visiting, and that's when they started the Google program for self-driving cars. And the way I like to look at this technology is actually an equalizing technology. So it's going to make uh, us all equal, right, number one. And so, so it doesn't really matter any longer if you're an aggressive driver and you cut everybody's way, and you're going to get that in 10 minutes before everybody else because the self-driving car is not going to allow you to do that, right? So you're actually going to go everybody else's pace and you're going to be as polite driving as everybody else because you can't do otherwise. So I love it, right? But I also love the idea that like everybody you know, is going to be able to go to work and be engaged in something that's more productive than just you know, holding the steering wheel with your hands, right? And so I think that that's the way we should design all technologies. This should be number one, good for everybody and it shouldn't just box us in a situation where we end up uh, wasting time in a traffic jam, for instance. Right? And so that's the spirit by which we're looking at emerging technologies. And truly, we do live times that are very exciting from this point of view. If you look at, if you are into engineering, you probably remember <laughs> from your readings, right, that steam engine, there were actually cars with steam engines, right? And so. Uh, I think the first one was actually 
uh, pulled together in France, right? That was 200 years ago, right? So it took a... It was there in Boston, I didn't know it. Okay, so, so there must be someone else who had done it before the French. But anyway, so whatever it was, you know, but it was quite a while ago, right? And it's only now that we get to means of transportation that I feel like it's a, it's a bit more sensible, right, in terms of the actual fruition of uh, your trip. So, and when we look at rehabilitation technologies, we do have technologies that are still broken, in my opinion. So there are lots of limitations with the technologies that we're developing, but they are way more exciting than the technologies that we had even in the recent past. And so we're going to touch upon technologies that have been already um, deployed uh, with, as I said, you know, a number of limitations, but um, the point in, in a direction that from my point of view is very exciting. So we will talk a bit about exoskeletons, for instance. And what we show here is the product of a spin of company of Dr. Caseronis at UC Berkeley, who started his project by focusing on human augmentation as part of the DARPA challenge, and then move into uh, redesigning the technology so that it could be utilized in a rehabilitation setting. And we're also going to talk a bit about the role of technology and robotics into some of the most recent discoveries and more um, provocative work that people in this area have been carrying out. And this is uh, Grégoire Cortin at EPFL in Switzerland, is there in Lausanne. And they've published over the past now about eight years a number of very interesting uh, studies, uh, primarily on, on animal models, in which they have focused on the combinations of technology and um, pharmacotherapies and implants to uh, restore function as opposed to augment function as, uh, as it's the case in, uh, in the case of exoskeleton. So what we do with uh, technology? So let's start getting an understanding of sort of the different type of applications um, of uh, rehabilitation robotic technologies. Right? So there are three types of different interventions uh, that, that we're looking to, or three different uses of this technology uh, that we're interested in. Too. The first one is retraining functions. And there are a number of systems. I assume that most of you are familiar with the program at Spalding. And there are a number of uh, technologies that are utilized to improve capabilities in individuals, and they are utilized across a number of different uh, populations, not uh, specifically not only uh, in spinal injury, but certainly applicable to uh, the spinal injury population. And they involve both retraining upper limb motor functions as well as lower limb motor function, and we will discuss shortly uh, about that. There are then another set of technologies that um, we uh, use to augment functions. Right? And so that is the case of the exoskeletons, and that's uh, the case of the uh, what we call the wearable robots, and we will talk a bit about that as well. And lastly, uh, there are uh, technologies that we use to facilitate restoring, uh, restoring function. Right? So let's start with retraining uh, upper limb uh, motor functions, right? Let me make sure that this runs properly. Let's see if we can get the videos running. Um, hopefully it's right there. And if it's not, I'll just restart it. So let's see if it, if it clicks properly. But what I want to show you here is technology that we're utilizing to retrain upper limb motor functions. And let me see if we can get the video to run, it ran just about 10 minutes ago. It's running, good, good. it just doesn't show on the screen here for a second, so I got confused, right? So, so this is a system where we facilitate the movements of the upper limbs by essentially guiding them. And this subject is um, playing interactive games, so it has uh, a virtual reality environment that is basically playing within. And, you know, you, of course, you'd have to set things up uh, to begin with and, and then 
um, you, you know, you start going through the uh, routine uh, exercises. And the interaction with the uh, robotic system is quite relevant from a number point of view, including some that relate to the way we actually learn how to perform uh, movements. And so these systems, if they are designed properly, they're actually designed with in mind not only the purpose of assisting the movement, but primarily, in fact, the purpose of uh, facilitating the learning process. So this is when you uh, have as the objective of using the technology, the one of improving, for instance, uh, the use of, of the upper limbs. There are a number of different systems uh, that are utilized in this context. Uh, the ones that you see in uh, the slide, they're two of the most prominent uh, systems utilized by several clinical sites. The one that you see on the bottom left is the one uh, that was designed first as uh, Neville Hogan and Eagle Krabs at MIT that really did um, they, do, uh, they did do uh, seminal work uh, in that area. And that is an example of what we call an end effector system. It's a system that essentially has a robotic arm and you have, has a single point of contact with the individual. And the individual kind of plays as if it, it was or she was holding the hand right of, of the uh, robotic system. And the robotic system is guiding or helping or actually making it more challenging uh, to perform uh, the movement. The one that you see on the top left is a system that was originally designed by Robert Rinert at ETH. ETH is like the MIT of Europe, as an excellent engineering school. And the approach that they took is the one of building, in fact, exoskeletons. So these are robotic systems that actually go around the body and wrap around the body. Not, not all the exoskeletons are wearable exoskeletons. So any object that goes around the, the body will be actually called uh, an exoskeleton because like in, in um, the case of the animal kingdom, if you will, right? And so uh, you, you would have an, an ob object that goes uh, around the body. Right? So what are the pros and cons of this uh, type of technology? So as I mentioned earlier, I just want to acknowledge uh, sort of both the advantages and limitations. So we're certainly enthusiastic about the developments in this area, but it's important that we also identify areas of work that we have to pursue as we, as we move forward. And so the, uh, the pros of these technologies are that, are that number one, there is um, good evidence of the efficacy of, the, of these systems, um, primarily in different populations, the spinal cord injury population. So that's, uh, that's a, a, unfortunately a limitation. Um, and there are also uh, quite a few systems out there that have implemented these advanced control systems that I was mentioning earlier, that not only assist the movement, but they're actually designed uh, in order to facilitate the learning process of improving the capabilities of, of the individual to perform uh, upper limb functions. The cons are what I mentioned earlier, that there is a limited evidence of efficacy or limited data in the spinal cord population of the use of these systems. It's, it's almost anecdotal. We usually refer to evidence as evidence at different levels. And typically, we do uh, refer to um, scientific evidence as from level one to five, or one is the top, and, and five, of course, is basically an expert um, opinion. And I would say that we're kind of in the middle here. We basically have uh, pilot studies or relatively small studies for upper limbs. It's different for, for the lower extremities. A major limitation of this system is access. And so the current use of this system, it's really uh, limited in terms of dosage. And you can easily imagine uh, training. Um, we have one of our end users just uh, um, uh, completed the marathon, right? And so, and that's, um, that's not something for which you train um, just in a few sessions. Right? And um, improving your upper limb functions is very similar from my standpoint in this regard. And so it's not something that you're going to, um, you're not going to see improvements, significant improvements just in a few sessions. It's, it's key 
that the intensity be there and the dosage be there. And unfortunately, these systems, um, uh, they are marked by relatively uh, limited access because of the cost and because of the way the therapy is, is delivered at this point in time. So there are similar systems for the lower limbs. I'm just checking the screen, make sure that it runs properly. Uh, this is a system that we actually develop uh, in house for um, scientific purposes. We ran a project sponsored by the National Science Foundation with a colleague at Northeastern University. Um, and specifically in that case, we were interested in the effects of manipulating um, the pelvis uh, during uh, retraining uh, sessions for the purpose of improving gait. Uh, but that's just a video that we're showing as an example of the research work that has been done in this area, not necessarily to highlight the characteristics of these specific systems. So this slide is here just to say that there are a number of laboratories, including our own laboratory, that have, have developed these technologies, and then gradually these technologies are being translated into uh, systems that can be utilized clinically. The two most prominent ones are the ones that are shown um, in this slide. The one on the top left is a system um, that's called the Locomat, and it's, a, again, an exoskeleton type of uh, system. It accompanies, essentially, the movements of the subject's legs by robotic legs that are strapped uh, to the um, lower limbs of the individual. And the uh, treadmill is synchronized with the movements of, of the robot, and so that you can actually train on the treadmill system. There are then systems as for the upper limbs that we would refer to as um, uh, end effector systems. And so you actually put your feet on foot plates and then the foot plates are actually going to move um, the uh, lower limbs, sort of mimicking the movement that you would observe during, um, during walking. So for both upper and lower limbs, there are pros and cons of exoskeleton versus an effector system. But here I'm, I'm focusing more on, on the general uh, pros and cons uh, of, of these systems. And if you are interested, just in passing, I want to mention and effector systems are more difficult to use when you have um, uh, joint issues, right? So for instance, if you have shoulder instabilities for the upper limbs, it's more difficult to use properly an end effector system because it's more difficult to avoid that you pull and pull and push on the shoulder than it is if you use an exoskeleton system. Whereas exoskeleton systems are difficult to align with the joints, the anatomical joints, they're not single axis joints and, and therefore it's difficult to maintain the alignment between the exoskeleton axis and the anatomical axis. But those are more you know, sort of technical uh, type of issues and issues that therapists would have to take care of as, as they work with subjects. But from more of an end user point of view, I think what I would want to know, right, is whether there is good evidence of efficacy of this system. So it's actually worth uh, for me to spend the time uh, to work with this system. And there is better evidence for lower limbs systems than for upper limb systems of their efficacy. Uh, there is still some controversy around it, but in the level of you know one to five that I mentioned earlier, we're closer to a two as opposed to closer to a three or a four. Mm -hmm. there, is, there are also, as for the upper limbs, uh, good systems that are designed properly from a technical point of view to facilitate um, the uh, progression of uh, motor capabilities over time. There is still, as for the upper limbs, a limited access to these technologies. So dosage is always relatively slow. The group uh, in, in, in the lab has, has run recently a retrospective study is from a retrospective study on clinical data that we have um, gathered that show that the number of sessions that typically people would undergo uh, varies between five and ten on average. And, and, and again, if we think of sort of the paradigm of the marathon, I think it would be a bit tough to get ready for the marathon in just five or, or 10 sessions, right? So it takes a bit more than that. And so, so intensity and dosage here 
that's quite an issue. In the same way you would train for a significant event like a marathon, you would want to do the same if you want to really achieve good uh, motor function. So that's the reason why a few of us, including a few of us in the uh, community of rehabilitation engineering, uh, as, as and specifically here at Spalding, we have been looking into implementing what we like to call sort of the robotic gym as part of wellness programs where individuals would actually have access to this type of equipment um, on a regular basis for interventions that are more aggressive than the type of interventions that uh, we're running at this point in time. And I think that that is truly the future and to make that possible, technology would have to be uh, redesigned in a number of ways. Uh, but that's what you have to ask the engineers. You have to ask uh, uh, people who work for you, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, and, as, and users, you want to demand this type of characteristics for the systems that are put onto the market. So the, the second area that I wanted to mention, as I said earlier, right, is the use of this technology for the purpose of augmenting motor functions. And one area uh, that we can f focus on to begin with, in parallel to what we have done for retraining, is the augmentation of upper limb motor functions. So there are a number of systems out there, just really few that are becoming available um, commercially available, so that are actually becoming available clinically, but quite a few of the people are developing um, out there in the, in the research community that I envision would be available in the clinic uh, relatively soon. What you see on the top left is a commercially available system, it's called Myoma, and that is essentially an exoskeleton that facilitates the elbow flexion extension and a bit of hand function in the latest versions uh, of the system. And what you see for the rest of the slide are crazy things that people are doing in the research uh, arena. Right? So there are things that are a bit more traditional now. So that's the soft systems that you see on the bottom. And uh, I'm, I'm acknowledging the contribution in, the, in this area uh, by Rob Awi, who is one of uh, the, the person on the right, uh, bottom right of the slide, who is one of the um, uh, fathers of, of, of the field, and um, is an incredible researcher, and he wanted, like often researchers do, um, to pick a really tough problem, and so he focused on shoulder movements, and as I believe everybody in the audience is familiar with, shoulder joints is a very complex joint to actually assist um, uh, the, the movement of which uh, we, we might want to assist with our robotic systems. And there is also a colleague um, uh, at uh, WPI, actually nearby, that's doing really interesting uh, uh, work with soft solutions uh, to facilitate hand movements, and that's Greg Fisher. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are crazy ideas that people are putting uh, forward in an attempt to augment functions in the most practical way. And one of the most brilliant ones, in my opinion, is Eriazada at MIT. And he came up with these robotic systems that you strap around your wrist, and then the uh, robotic fingers, they're actually augmenting the capabilities of your hand. So if, uh, if your hand functions are limited, then these extra robotic fingers are actually helping you in manipulating objects. And so I'm hoping, because uh, Eria has a good tradition of spinning off companies and going to commercializing these technologies, that this technology will be available soon. Then there are lower limb uh, systems, and you see one of the systems that we have here at Spalding, we have a few. We have a couple of systems that are commercially available and a couple of systems that we're using just for research purposes. So there's the Exo from Exobionics that was originally designed by Caseroni, uh, Dr. Caseroni at UC Berkeley. And you see the process of uh, um, getting up for a chair and walking, and this particular use of the system here is assisted by uh, the therapist who's actually guiding 
uh, the movement of, of the lower limbs. We have also a rewalk system that you uh, have probably seen, and it's in some of, of the um, uh, following slides. And it's very similar in terms of the way it actually the, the system works, just slightly different in terms of the form factor, but very similar in terms of the way it's controlled and the way the subject uh, would use it, just small differences. They make the two systems not perfectly compatible, so it's like driving a Porsche versus driving a Ford. You don't want to switch all the times between the two because it's really not the same thing. And so, but it's, um, it's not sort of a dramatically um, big difference between the way the two systems work. Now, um, if we go back to what I was saying earlier, that the technology is broken, right? So this is a, an example of one of those technologies for which we have a lot of enthusiasm because we see the potential, but we also see the limitations right off the bat. So it's extremely important physiologically to be in the upright position it has a lot of uh, great um, benefits from a physiological point of view. One that we're studying with funding from the Department of Defense is the effect on bone health. Uh, but it's very well documented that you have uh, uh, effects on a, a number of physiological variables. However, purely from a mobility point of view, the system is low. Right? And so what I like that some of our colleagues have done, it's not work that we have done, now we're here is to be very practical, and particularly like the work that Michael Goldfarb has done at Vanderbilt University. Right? And so imagine that you're catching a flight and you really have to get to the gate fast. You're not going to walk with Go Michael Goldfarb's exoskeleton because it would take you 30 minutes to get to the gate. Right? And so, but what they've done is that they have designed a system that you can package. It's very compact as you fold it. You can put it in your bag and then you get on your wheelchair and you go fast uh, wherever you need to go. Right? And so there are still the benefits of sort of the upright position. And so I would have no hesitation myself uh, if I happen to be an end user, right? To look at these as um, uh, pieces of hardware that I'm definitely interested in too. I would want to try it and, and I would want to pick and choose whatever works uh, best for me, but I wouldn't do it for the purpose of improving mobility because moving around with your wheelchair is going to be more way more practical for that um, from, from that point of view. But in terms of what we envision might happen with the technology as we move forward, this is certainly a direction that's extremely uh, exciting for us. Uh, the, the picture that I put on the, on the top left, it's uh, something that um, I decided to put there, not as an example of a system that I would recommend necessarily to uh, use in individuals with spinal cord injury, but because this was taken in Chicago and they were just uh, trying to uh, sort of experiment with the really first exoskeleton that was put on the market by a Japanese company. And to their surprise, they got them to walk down one of the most crowded areas and nobody pay attention um, to them. And the reason why that is relevant from my point of view is because I think that over time, we have looked into, we have witnessed that this technology has become more and more acceptable from a social point of view, right? So, so back in the days, perhaps, having three individuals walking down a crowded Newbury Street, right? Uh, with exoskeletons would have had everybody turning. Nobody was paying attention to them actually when they walked down in Chicago. I guess they must have gone down the magnificence miles, whatever whatever that was, right? So, but that's that's a report that I think is quite interesting. The other systems that you see here are systems that are relatively traditional in terms of engineering uh, design. So, the, what we like to call rigid frames, as well as some of the work that uh, Connor Walsh is doing at the VC Institute, as part of Harvard University, with the exploration of soft exoskeleton. That's what we envision. It's going to be really the future uh, of these systems once we figure out a way to have enough uh, force generated by the system so that they can actually be suitable for uh, individuals who would be otherwise unable um, to stand. 
as we deploy these systems in the field, it's key that we do that in a way that's uh, safe, and it's becoming quite obvious to us that it's necessary that we monitor individuals in the field. You know? And so that's the concept, if you will, of the lifeline system, for those of you who are familiar with the Philips system of, you know, what happens if um, a person that's part of the family who lives on his own or own, right, kind of falls uh, at home, right, and nobody is around, right? And so and with this technology, I, in my opinion, it's becoming really key that this type of monitoring be put in place, right? because irrespective of the uh, motor abilities of the individuals who are actually wearing these and uh, using these exoskeletons. If you happen to fall with an exoskeleton, it's extremely difficult, particularly for rigid frames, to get up on your feet. You know? And so and from, it's, it's key that we have this type of monitoring in place for safety, but also it's key because the conditions that we simulate in a laboratory settings are very limited compared to the conditions that you encounter in, in real life. And so still these systems are a bit like the first cars with a steam engine, right? And so we're really at the beginning of the development of these technologies. There is still quite a bit that needs to be done. And so with sensing technology, we can remotely monitor whether there are problems and we can actually address them remotely. And so this is what you see in the slide here is sort of a schematic representation of this remote monitoring of individuals that my group, as well as many others, have implemented using mobile phones and the internet and the technologies that uh, I trust, uh, you know, we're all familiar with. As part of the human augmentation um, uh, projects, I like to think of service robots as a key component, right? And this is something I would really like to have myself. I, I actually enjoy very much cooking, but I wouldn't honestly mind just going home in the evening and just tell the robots that, you know, I just want scrambled eggs and that's it, you know, I just want to sit on the sofa, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is actually becoming something uh, within, uh, within reach. And there are all sorts of uh, service robots and there are, um, a few examples here. The one that you see on the left side is actually a system uh, that's developed for use in combination with a wheelchair, but it actually relies upon technology that you see on the left side of the screen, and there are two of the individuals that we have contacts with. Uh, I mentioned Rob before. Uh, Bill Townsend is another collaborator of ours, um, and he spun off a company out of MIT about 15, 20 years ago now, almost. Um, and what they do is that they design these robotic systems that are robotic arms that have incredible dexterity, the capability of manipulating all sorts of objects. And we are extremely excited about the next generation of systems that are coming out. And these are really a robotic system with soft interfaces. And what we mean by that is the following, right? So they kind of mimic nature to, to some extent. And imagine, you know, um, your kids or, or, you know, your nephew comes in and you want to give them a hug, right? And so then your arms are going to be very flexible. We call it compliant, right? And so, but if you want to push an object, right, then what you do is that you co-contract muscles and your arm becomes really stiff, yeah? And these robotic systems that have these soft, um, adaptive interfaces, they're extremely interesting for us because imagine situation that you had in the previous slide where you're using, for instance, the robotic arm to help uh, yourself uh, as you uh, are having a meal, right? And imagine that the robot, uh, the robot actually controller doesn't work properly, right? Would you want a rigid robotic hand just to touch your face, right? That's going to be more like a punch, right? It's not good, right? You would rather be slapped than getting a punch, right? And so with soft interfaces, one of the key issues that we, you know, the engineering community is addressing is that even in case of unlikely but possible errors in the control of the robotic arm, then the interface is actually not going to hurt you, right? 
And so, and then of, of course the industry is incredibly interested in these solutions because imagine you're picking up fruit, you know, from baskets and putting that in boxes so it can be shipped, right? Of course you want something that's very compliant distally because you don't want to ruin the produce, right? So very good synergy. So it's something that I think we're going to see soon in the clinic. In that context, right, we see robots that are actually roaming through the house. You might have one already if you have a Roomba, right? And so, and for those of you who are familiar with the Roomba, you're actually seeing something similar to your Roomba on the bottom of this robot. In fact, uh, uh, iRobot created this system, it's called iCreate, and it's essentially a Roomba without vacuum cleaning capabilities that you can control. Yeah? And so we built all the remote capabilities and we figure what if we have to respond to an emergency situation, the one I was mentioning earlier, well, let's assume we have an individual with an exoskeleton, we have sensors on the exoskeleton, we know that the subject fell, right? What do we do? We have a robotic system in the home setting and the robotic system gets there. So get, this is of course a simulation uh, that we ran into the laboratory and sort of gives you sort of the gist of what we're trying to accomplish. In that context, robotics is very useful for mobility. And it almost made me cry that a few years ago, Dean Kamen from DECA came up with his iBot idea, which I think was really brilliant. But then they didn't manage to figure out a way to get it to fruition, right? And so the product really was a bit of a flop. It was too expensive, you know, it just didn't take off. And luckily, they are revisiting this concept. They announced this with Toyota, right? And Toyota, I think, is large enough so that we can actually get sort of the equivalent of a Corolla version, right, of the iBot, right? The iBot, I think, was too much of a Mercedes, right? And so, so it didn't take off the way I was hoping to see it was going to take off. Um, but I'm hoping that, um, you know, the Toyota group is going to do a good job. And Gil Pratt, uh, who is a Bostonian, right, is a, 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 a was one of the leaders of the Lag Lab at MIT and then moved to Walling College and then was a program director at DARPA, is now the person who actually runs um, the R&D in this area for Toyota. So I trust that we're going to see incredibly good things, right? Lots of these systems, they're based like the robotic arms that I mentioned earlier, on the use of joysticks. And there are cases in which the joystick is really not a suitable interface for us, so we want something different. And there are quite a few people that are looking into uh, figuring out what you want from your thoughts, which is a bit scary, right? From my point of view, at least, right? But uh, it works really well if you're busy with your hands. And so I'm showing there a picture of some work uh, that Jose del Milan is doing a PFL in Lausanne in which they're using uh, dense EEG arrays and they interpret essentially the brain activity in order, for instance, to drive a wheelchair. So finally, I want to mention before wrapping this up, uh, a couple of things in the area of restoring function. This is um, fascinating to me, and it's a combination between technology and, and the biology. And there are two groups that I want to mention. There are many that are actually working in this area, but one that, in my opinion, is pursuing the most exciting ideas is led by Grégoire Cotin at APFL in Lausanne. I mentioned APFL a number of times. They have a fantastic uh, neuroengineering uh, program. Uh, it's, uh, it's an excellent school, and they decided to focus on certain areas, and this is one of their priority areas. And so, and they have funding both from the VIS as well as the Bertha Riley Foundation. And so they are, they are in a position of launching these long-term projects where they don't anticipate good results um, uh, within just a year or two. They're looking into five to ten years time frames. And Gregoire, uh, after training there and then moving to California, it was at UCLA as a postdoc, then he moved back there, and he has run at least two incredible projects. One that consisted of um, causing lesions in rats, uh, spinal lesions, and uh, developing 
methodologies to facilitate essentially the rewiring of the spine. And so what happens often is that although a spinal cord injury might be considered complete at one level, the reality is that the damage, if you will, it's at multiple levels, and you have routes that can go around the damage on both sides. And so he developed, together with a number of collaborators, uh, he developed a system by which they injected drugs that facilitate um, neurotransmission, um, sort of using two pathways that we call serotonergic and dopaminergic. Those are essentially uh, transmitters that allow neurons to work. And they figure out that by purely injecti injecting drugs, they weren't going to get the rerouting they were hoping, so they designed a stimulator that actually has electrodes that go around the spine and provide stimulations with currents that are oriented properly. And then they build a small robot to get the rat actually to walk, right? So the, the drawing that you see there, it's actually because the robot is attached to um, an unloading system and is walking on the hind limbs. Right? And what they show is that you can actually get this rerouting to work, which is quite uh, phenomenal. And more recently, they've done something similar uh, in non-human primates. And so that's something that we, they published very recently, in which as opposed to attempt to do the rerouting, they have bypassed completely uh, the spinal cord. And so what they do is that they have intracortical arrays, they basically read from cortical areas and then wirelessly they transmit to a stimulator that provides what we call epidural stimulation, so a stimulation directly of the spine. And they actually have been able to recreate walking patterns in monkeys. And this is, um, this is still uh, experimental, it's very scientific, if you will, but the hope is these techniques are going to be available broadly in the future. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, at the end of the past month, um, we had an e-publication of a fabulous paper that came out uh, primarily of a group at Case Western University, uh, Case Western University in Cleveland. Um, uh, no offense to anybody here, it's not my favorite city, but it, when, you look at, when you look at a group that knows how to work with the stimulation of muscles, uh, you have to go to Cleveland. They are absolutely fantastic. They do an incredible job. Right? And so what they have done, again, is to use intracortical arrays. They did it in collaboration with uh, individuals here at Harvard and at Brown University. Uh, and they... Um, implanted cortical arrays, two sets. They wirelessly transmitted, again, to a receiver uh, peripherally. But now, as opposed to try to stimulate the uh, spinal cord, they actually drove the stimulation of muscles, right? And they actually implanted 36 electrodes in the upper lips of this gentleman. And they got the gentleman with unloading of the limb to actually be able to perform movements out of his own thoughts. So this is certainly exciting technology, at least from my point of view. Not unfortunately something that's ready for fruition, uh, you know, at this point in time. It's not something that's utilized clinically, but I'm hoping that that is going to happen soon. So uh, let, let me wrap the, this up. I, I want to be sure that we have enough time for the, for the panel discussion. I wanted to um, convince you that the technology is, is broken, but there is a lot of excitement about technologies that we are developing for the field of rehabilitation at the moment. And so that's where the idea of the, the future is here um, came from. We, um, I, I talked to you about technology that are utilized to retrain, augment, and restore Motor, fu motor functions in individuals with spinal cord injury. There are quite a lot of opportunities in this area. There is tremendous potential, in my opinion, for these technologies as long as we um, set up programs that deliver high dosage. Uh, so there is tremendous uh, potential for achieving uh, good motor gains, so good improvements in, in motor functions when retraining is the objective. 
there is quite a bit that's happening also in the area of um, deploying technology that augments uh, capabilities. So it makes your life easier, right? As you drive your car, right? You might want to have a service robot that prepares your meals, right? Or you want simply to improve your mobility in the home environment using these technologies. And we can make this safe by using these uh, remote monitoring capabilities that I mentioned earlier. And, and there is quite a lot of interest for restoring function using a combination of techniques and findings in biology. So part of the work that um, I presented or summarized earlier is work that's done by others uh, in the US and elsewhere in the world. Part of the work is work that's done here in, in, in my lab. And so I wanted to acknowledge the contributions of uh, people on the team. We have a mix of engineers and uh, clinical researchers. Um, and so I want to uh, thank them, uh, take the opportunity to acknowledge the contribution and thank them. So this is my contact information. I would like to propose that we move straight to the panel discussion. We take questions from the audience. We have uh, two end users and three um, therapists. And so some of the questions that you might have might be better answered by end users or by the therapists. Um, I can certainly talk uh, about technologies, but this is what I wanted to uh, tell you about. And if there will be, if there is no time uh, for you to ask questions in the next half an hour or so, and you're interested in gathering some information from me, you're welcome to send me an email uh, message. The, my email address is right there. Please just write in the subject title that you attended this event so that I can um, identify the message easily and, and get back to you rapidly. So thank you very much. So I was going to ask uh, people on the panel to introduce themselves. I can see that there are already quite a few um, people who want to ask questions, but uh, so I'll just pass the microphone just quickly so that we can have a quick introduction and then I can see we're set up to take questions. So. Hello, my name's uh, Katie Schramm. I'm a physical therapist here at Spalding uh, in the outpatient department. And I've been lucky enough to help uh, in a very small way with some of the research um, that uh, Dr. Bonato has been doing. And I also help um, work with some of the exoskeletons, both in the clinic <clears throat> and also um, as part of the research. Hi, my name is Tim Morris. I am an end user. Um, I've been using the technology here uh, at the hospital for uh, a few years now. Uh, I've been fortunate to try a few different uh, model systems and um, looking forward to answering any questions. Hi, my name is Eric Larson. Uh, I was used this uh, exoskeleton for a six months or a six weeks sorry, st uh, study program. My name is Ann O'Brien. I'm an inpatient physical therapist here at Spalding, and then I also work as a um, research therapist in the motion analysis lab. Hello, my name is Catherine Adanzester. I'm a PT by background. I'm working in the motion analysis lab as a research therapist uh, with um, robotic technologies. Um. About the restoring functionality, is there any interest at all in repairing ischemic damage where there isn't just a traumatic break in one small place, but rather lesions in multiple places where they, there'll be multiple things to circumvent? Is, is anybody even thinking about that? This is this would be best for a physician. So I don't know if Sherry has any comments, but certainly in the groups that I mentioned earlier, right, they are doing quite a bit of work in the area of facilitating uh, conduction through uh, neurofacilitation techniques, right. And so um, 
if if you send me an email message uh, later, I can actually send you a few references to uh, papers in that regard. The work that I'm aware of is all in animal models at this point in time, though. I, my comment is a person who's a paraplegic and won't drink the manual chair Kool-Aid is you got to lose the crutches. Uh, I mean, it's bad enough losing my legs, but they give you a manual chair or, or crutches, and you're taking my arms away too because I've got to want to have a life where I can use my hands and my arms for doing things besides just pushing myself around. Um, so I'm just suggesting... Uh, if you could look at models that don't use crutches and leave people their arms is a place to go. So that, that's an excellent question. Um, there is a group at Virginia Tech uh, that I've been in touch with, and we want to start a project using their technology. And what they've done is that they actually have uh, built self-balancing systems. So you, if you wear it as an exoskeleton, you can fall because the exoskeleton is going to keep you from falling. But I think this would be really interesting for a end user. Yeah. Um, to, to your comment, um, obviously I'm, I'm going to have to agree that it is difficult to uh, do much in a, while you're in the exoskeleton rather than focus on, on just walking. It's very difficult to, you know, to carry a plate or even you know a, a drink or anything if uh, if you wanted to I think what right now I think the skeleton is not designed for everyday use um, you know it doesn't you can't walk fast in it so it's not it's not practical for outdoor use this is still something that's in its beginning stages so that's something that hopefully they can figure out down the line where it becomes more practical that it can be used instead of a wheelchair but I think at right now, that's not where it's at. It's just they're still trying to gather more details. And I think that's what the study that we were in is trying to help them do. Um, I think that's an excellent point. And if I can kind of put a little hope into it, I think even just seeing in the last few years some of the changes that have come out from a therapist perspective. Um, so the XO 1.1 is the one hanging here, which was kind of the original exoskeleton. Um, they've come out with a newer version and, and I've had the opportunity to work on both. And so even the, there's a significant difference in how reliant people are on their upper extremities. Um, in just those couple generations of change. Um, the newer one, it can be only a cane, for example, that you're using as opposed to a, uh, both of your upper extremities. Um, so I, I'm seeing some hope that that's, that's coming because um, even in the last few years, I've noticed a big difference. And I, I think sometimes too, that even relates with how some of the therapists might view technology too, that if it seems very cumbersome or if it's going to take me that extra time to get somebody into it, that they might kind of shy away from it. So it's it's something that needs to, I think, you know, be easier to get into if it's used at home or even if it's used with a, with, in a therapy session. Um, and then you can feel like it's a little bit more effective. Oh, okay. Um, there's a, there seem to be, I hate to use the word silos, but there, of necessity, I guess, the focus on, say, nanotechnology, and then you have further miniaturization in the electronics area, and you had a picture of the monkey up there with the, uh, able to use the legs uh, because of the circuitry that are, is embedded. And I'm just wondering, are there, is there any, integrated work going on that's uh, the spinal issue is a huge one and is there anything going on with the nanotechnology and the microelectronics that might accelerate the functionality of that for people so so the second example that I showed there so the first slide actually show two of the animal models right? 
whereas the the second slide on the restoration of function show actually an example of application in the human subject and in, in uh, all the examples above the miniaturization of the electronics is quite remarkable to be honest and imagine that what you actually do is to record neural activity from cortical areas you wirelessly transmit it right? and you process it so that you can infer the movement that the subject is attempting to perform and then you deliver wirelessly to the uh, stimulation device and the stimulation device is either going to uh, deliver stimulation to the, sp uh, to the spine or it's going to deliver stimulation to muscles in a way that's actually coordinated uh, in such a way that the motor output corresponds to the movement of the subject is trying to perform. Right? There is certainly more that um, people are attempting to do in, in that area, but I think that in terms of uh, miniaturization of the system, we're pretty much, um, we're pretty much there. Um, I don't think that we're going to need a lot more progress from that point of view. I think that the obstacle now is more along the lines of uh, the reliability of, of these systems and the clinical, um, clinical studies uh, around this technology. Uh, we have a question on the webcast. And first, thank you for providing such a fascinating and thought-provoking information. It's great to see biology and technology combine for such a great cause. I'm currently 3D printing. How will 3D printing reduce the cost and improve exoskeleton technology and the lives of SCI and other patients? Thank you. So I can speak very uh, quickly about it. Uh, there is quite a lot happening in that area. Um, with Northeastern University, we have explored uh, the capability of scanning the body using traditional photographic techniques, but with multiple cameras, so that we can uh, achieve a 3D reconstructions of body segments. And for instance, 3D printing is a fantastic technique for us to um, uh, design systems, to print systems that perfectly fit the body, so they're actually very comfortable to use. We have done that uh, with ankle foot orthosis, for instance. Um, we have and pushed that from a research point of view simply because um, I'm going to sound not very modest here, so it's a good idea, right? And so companies just pick it up. So you can actually buy these things out there. So there are actually people who work in our group, right? That were hired by companies that now actually do this type of work out there, right? And so. Um, it's fantastic from my point of view. It's a really good thing. It's a really good thing when we can get to a stage where we can say, oh, this is a project that we're going to terminate because the industry picked it up and now the service that's provided to end users, it's, it's what we wanted to see in place. So that's, that's an idea uh, outcome, right? So, so, but I wanted to take the opportunity if, if there are no more pressing questions from um, the web um, uh, viewers, right? I wanted to take the opportunity just to do a round uh, here with the panel, right? And so, because we have here individuals who are using this system clinically as well as end users, I wanted to hear from the panel about your experience, what you see as pros and cons, and because, you, you know, we, we have another, you know, 15 minutes, so I'm just going to cut it sort of to to the to the chase, and I also wanted to hear from the panel what they would like to see as technology. What you know, as end user, you feel like would be your dream, right? And so, if you had, we we kind of play these games from time to time in a research environment. We say, okay, if you had unlimited resources, and you know, the sky's the limit, and you could do whatever you want, right? Because you have all the engineering community ready for you and NIH is putting money on you, right? And so what would you like to see happening over the next few years? Well, um, maybe I can start by speaking to some of the pros and cons just in my experience uh, as a clinician working with folks uh, within these uh, gate training devices. Um, I think that from an early mobility perspective, especially folks um, that have recently been injured, they provide a significant opportunity for any uh, neuromuscular re-education that we can do, and it really gives uh, 
the folks that we work with an opportunity to be upright, to be standing, to be weight bearing, which we know that they have, there's so many benefits to that early on uh, that it sets the foundation for that for folks. Uh, and then even individuals who have uh, a more chronic injury, it can really provide them the stability and the alignment to be in that weight bearing position and, and practice some gait training. Um, so I think those are kind of uh, un non measurable uh, benefits to the systems. Uh, some of the drawbacks are it it is cumbersome. I think the technology has a ways to go to make it a little bit more user friendly, uh, a little more fast to to put on and take off, and just to make it a little bit more functional. And then myself as a clinician, I think one of the downsides I see is that we can't fit these robots to everyone. So there's a there's only so much wiggle room we have in adjusting these robots as they are currently. So there are a lot of folks that while theoretically they're very appropriate for, for the interventions, we can't get them in the, in the device because they're too tall or their ankles are too tight or things like that, um, which as a clinician, you hate to see, you hate to turn somebody away um, because we can't adjust the robot enough to fit them. Um, and then I think one of the other downsides that you, you alluded to is there's this counterbalance with our current healthcare system of access. Um, I think that that's a hard component that we don't really have a good answer for quite yet, um, is if these things, if the research is really supporting that these devices are, are helpful, how can we maximize people's access to them and actually allow them to gain the benefit from them? Well, as a as a user, um, I think many of the pros have actually uh, been touched on tonight. Uh, the physical benefits, the weight bearing, the uh, bone density, the ability to ambulate, to walk, and you know still have the stimulus of you know the pounding of the foot for your bone density is significant um, over passive or active um, static standing. You know, standing in place. Um, um, being, being, I've noticed in it, it's been a few months since I've been uh, walking in an exoskeleton, and I've uh, noticed uh, you know a drop in in muscle mass, and I can feel um, it, you know a, a little bit more um, you know I I can feel contracture uh, beginning to set in through my hamstrings and in my hip flexors you know as I'm I'm spending more time sitting down. Um, the drawbacks, um, I agree, not being able to, to use your hands, but as we've discussed, that technology is coming. Um, the donning and doffing of the suit, the, uh, the ability to get in and um, getting in the suit um, by yourself, getting out of the suit by yourself, it's difficult now. Um, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure that technology is, um, is coming. Um, Like I said earlier, I've only I did on a short six week study, so I didn't get feel the, as much of the bone density as um, Tim did here. Um, but for me, what was nice was just the change of pace of being in a different position, looking at somebody in the eyes instead of looking up at them. Um, you know, whether it's the therapists that are working with us or my family that came in with me. Uh, my son came in one time and he looked at me and goes, "I forgot how tall you were." Um, because he was also, uh, he was 21 now, so he's, he is this tall as if I was standing, but when I was injured, he was as tall as me sitting down. So for him, it was just, it was just like, oh, wow, yes. Um, and for me, the, it was a lot of work to walk. It's not just simple, you know, it's not just simply standing up and one leg moves and the other leg moves. You've got to do a lot of work. Um, you know, you've got to move the crutches a certain way. You've got to shift your body left or right, depending on which foot you're moving. You've got to hit certain targets so the, the, the machine will work for you. Um, so it was a, it was a lot. Of, I, I would leave this tired. My arms would be very well shot. Um, and some days I had good days where I'd walk 500 steps, and other days I'd walk 300 steps, um, just depending on how my body was was working that day and and whatnot. Um, 
Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a newbie thing. It's going to take some time to get to that next level with it, I think. Um, you know, being able to use it, being able to go faster would be nice. Um, that was one thing I joke with the girls all the time. I says, you know, let's put the run speed on. Because, you know, they would, I, could, I could get to a point where I could use it on my own, but it was still a very slow process. It wasn't a normal gait. It was still took a lot of work. Um, so that's what I would like to see, you know, in the future, if it becomes better, you know, to be able to go at a normal pace. Um, yeah, and for the record, you're still taller than your son. Yes. We measured. <laughs> Um, I'll comment, I guess, on the, the wish list since you asked. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that the new Spalding photo that you had up there with the giant room with all the different robotics and people using them at the, ta the same time. But I think that is one of the limitations is that, um, say, like for when you're doing therapy, that there is like a setup time and then the time that people are actually maybe using the robotics is um, a little bit limited. And we always want more time. so. In a perfect world, I think if getting somebody in and out of the robotics or maybe somebody that isn't, you know, your licensed therapist, you know, could put them in it and then you could still have another session that you could do some other types of training with them, whether it be the arms or the legs uh, would be great. Um, and having, it, you know, a little bit less expensive so then maybe you could have a couple of devices because even now I'm thinking of like the ro the locomat that we have upstairs I could imagine two people being in and you know one being in, in, if we had two devices two there there and one therapist with two patients would be a lot more effective and I think it actually would be something safe that we could do and um, it would be a little bit more productive um, and so, you know, so there's certainly the cost and space and, and time of the therapist using um, the, it with the skill. And then for home use, I think it would be great if we, if there was more access to, you know, lightweight, cheap, you know, cheaper types of devices for, you know, helping people to be able to, you know, self-feed or something like that. It's, it's really not that feasible for home use. It might be more um, better use like in the clinic setting. So if, um, you know, some of the engineers can make something newer and um, safe and a little bit less um, less money, that would be great. I'm not sure what I can add from um, what um, Katie, um, Eric, Tim, and Anne already said. Um, maybe I can add something to the wish list. Um, I think there is a lot of technologies available out there, as you may have seen in uh, in the presentation. Something that I would like to see in the future is it's sort of gyms or like even area where you have all the technologies or almost all of them available that you can as an end on user, even as a therapist, go with your patient and actually try different system to try to figure out which one would be the most appropriate, the one which is the most comfortable because something that works from one client will not be the same for the other one. So especially when the technology is still very expensive, there is really a need to be able to try to experience it a numerous um, number of time before actually investing in the technology. Perhaps also getting into this uh, robotic gym concept in which you can go um, and like pay a small fee and actually have therapist or rehab aid helping you um, to use um, those devices and, and get um, your exercise done. So I'm, I'm just going to look at the organizers. I think we want to wrap this up. Uh, short. You have another question? I do if you I have could. And you just yeah. about answered it on the panel, but not quite. And so question is, how do people even get robotics like Rewalk? Does insurance cover the purchase of an item like this? Um, so that's a, it, it's not a simple answer. Um, so there have been, Rewalk is one of the only FDA approved uh, devices for, for home use. And there has been some that have been covered by some private insurances and it's a very lengthy process. I have not personally been involved in it, so I'm, I can't speak to the specifics of it, but um, similar to other forms of DME, you know, uh, durable medical equipment like wheelchairs and things like that, it was a very, almost exaggerated process comparable to that where uh, there was a lot of letters written, um, a lot of folks that needed to be advocating for it in the in the background and it took the few that have 
been covered took quite a bit of time. Uh, a lot of the other devices are not FDA approved for home use, so they're currently just used in the clinic. Um, and that's not possible right now. Um, but Rewalk is one of the ones that has, but uh, it's only a few insurance providers. From a clinical standpoint and even a use standpoint, that becomes challenging, and that's kind of something that some of these companies are currently working on with different insurance providers, but unfortunately some of the insurance providers don't cover the use of these robotics um, as even treatment options for folks. Um, uh, and they, and one of the things or one of the challenges with such a evolving uh, field as technology is the research struggles to catch up and keep up with the changing uh, technology and then the insurance companies are always looking for that research to justify um, whether or not we can use it in the clinic. So it's kind of a ongoing discussion um, and something that we're all working towards kind of maximizing. I'll just uh, add just one uh, element. So there are quite a few companies that are actually trying to manufacture these systems at a very uh, reduced cost. So what we have seen over the past five years is the emerging of companies that are trying to uh, manufacture and commercialize these systems for about a fourth to a fifth of the cost that these systems had just a few years ago. So um, I don't have sort of the price list, so I'm going just to tell you ballpark, right? So one of these systems that are used in the clinic would typically go for about 100,000 to 130,000. Right. These systems that, uh, so I mean, I can say because you guys can just Google and you're going to find it, right? So the Phoenix system that Caseroni is designing now, they are uh, aiming to commercialize it for 20 to 25, right? So there has been quite a push toward um, acknowledging the fact that, you know, this technology is not going to fly if, if you have to spend the equivalent of two Lexus cars, right? It's going to fly, if it's going to be a ballpark, in sort of a Corolla, right, type of price range, right? And so in that case, it's going to work. And so, and from the engineering point of view, that is possible. So we do need to end the program for tonight, but if anyone has any other questions, um, you can distinctly email and Paulo will be able to answer. You can let him know, anyone that's on the webcast or in the room. Um, we are really glad that we got to have you here tonight. I guess the last thing we'll just say is that we are very grateful that you all came. Thank you for being here. We are very grateful. And we have our, our next lecture is going to be coming up for Knowledge in Motion on June 22nd. Jennifer Coker will come from Craig Hospital to present on alternative and complementary medicine and SCI. And so thank you. That concludes the evening. And I'm sure you could, they will be around for a few more minutes if you have any questions and want to speak with them. Thank you, everybody.